Good morning. It is 9 a.m. Central Standard Time, 6-1-2021. We want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center uh, virtual field trip. Sorry you can't be here in person, but hopefully soon you will be able to. Uh, we want to say a very special welcome to Casa View Dallas ISD and Calle Dallas ISD. Teachers, if you are watching, Teachers, if you are watching and you have not filled out I'm sorry. Teachers, if you are watching and you have not filled out a registration, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register and sign up. Uh, this is just for our attendance record only. During this virtual field trip, students will discover that, that organisms undergo similar life processes. Students will explore and compare life cycles of living organisms. Ms. Fuller will tell you about the life cycle of a plant. Ms. Ramirez will discuss the life cycle of a darkling beetle. Ms. Nash will demonstrate the life cycle of a butterfly. And Mr. Monroe will tell you all about the life cycle of a quail. Uh, during this field trip, you cannot speak to us verbally, but you can go, if you have questions, you can go to www.tiny.cc slash CEC space question space answer, fill out a form, send it to us. I'll do my best to answer them during the program. If not, I'll send the answers to your teacher. Uh, now I am going to stop sharing my screen and Ms. Fuller is going to discuss the life cycle of a plant. Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome to my lab. We're gonna be talking about the life cycle of a plant. Now, before we get started with our PowerPoint, I wanna show you something. If you've ever eaten collard greens, you know they're a big old leaf and you cut it up and cook it with onions and bacon and it's delicious. But did you know what the seeds look like? Well, when this, the, the plant bolts, now all the leaves are gone, I've fed them all to my, uh, my guinea pigs and my crickets and all that's left, it's gone to seed. And it, the seed pods look like little bitty tiny green beans. Can you see that? Now, when you look at that, can you see the, the little tiny bumps on the side? Inside of every one of those bumps is a little black seed and that will make a new collard plant. How about that? So a little bitty tiny seed makes a great big old plant. So let's go ahead and look at the PowerPoint here. And we're gonna look at different kinds of plants. So the title of this segment is Life Cycle of Plants, Size, Color, Flowers, and Fruits Can Make a Difference. Now the pictures you see at the bottom here are starting on the left, a pine cone, and inside that pine cone are some seeds to make a pine tree. They're very small, they have a little papery uh, airplane uh, wing type thing on them. When the pine cone opens, that little seed falls out and that little papery part helps it fly away from the, the, the parent plant. The next one's a little, um, uh, little plant, little tiny, just starting out. And then the pine itself, uh, fully grown, fully mature, is over there on the right-hand side. And you can see that they are very, very, very tall, much taller than your house probably. So what starts as a little bitty seed can grow into an enormous tree. Now, I'm gonna show you a little power, a little uh, video from our garden here. Now we're gonna start out by looking at uh, tomato plants. And these tomato plants started from a seed. I mean, in just a minute, you're gonna see what the seed of a tomato looks like. You've probably already eaten it if you've ever eaten a hamburger that has a slice of tomato on it. And those little yellow flowers are where the, the tomato is gonna form. And uh, we are in the raised bed garden here at the environmental center. When you come next year, you'll be able to go over there and see what we have growing next year. 
There is uh, Oreo and there is CV, uh, two of our cattle. And here is another raised bed garden. And in this, we've got lots of different kinds of plant. There's a watermelon plant. You know what watermelon seeds look like because we all enjoy those in the summertime. Now, the, uh, over in this section are some okra plants and there's a dill plant. All of these started from seeds. There's another tomato plant turning a little bit yellow because we've had a little bit too much rain. And uh, over here, I'm gonna show you a plant that did not start from a seed. That is a turnip. And that turnip, uh, when I cut it, the, the top of it started growing a new plant. So I stuck it in the ground. So let's go ahead and leave our little environmental center uh, video and uh, come over and, and get into the, the other part of the program. And let's keep some essential questions in mind as we go through this PowerPoint. Number one, how can plants get started in life? I've already given you a real big hint on that. Number two, what do we call the plant after the seed germinates, after, it, after the little plant cracks out of the seed, it lifts its uh, stem up toward the sun and its root down toward the center of the earth? What do we call that? Now, seeds, let's start with seeds. Almost all of us are real familiar with seeds because we eat them. The new plant begins in a seed and when the seed germinates, the tiny stem raises up and the tiny root goes down toward the center of the earth because of gravity. Now, this is a type of tropism, a re reaction to stimuli. The little stem growing up is a negative response to, to uh, gravity and the little root going down is a positive. Remember, if, if the organism goes toward the stimulus, it's considered a positive response. This particular type of tropism is called geotropism or gravitropism. Now over on the left, we have pictures of coconuts growing in a, a coconut palm. They are great big, about this big, and, um, excuse me, and um, the, one of those coconuts, if you plant it, will form a coconut palm. And um, this is one of the biggest seeds in the whole wide world and they are delicious. Uh, over on the right hand side are sunflower seeds and you're familiar with those if you've ever watched a baseball game. And in the middle is a seedling. When the plant germinates and the stem starts to go up and the root starts to go down, we call this a seedling. All right, now the next one, uh, this is one of my favorite plants in the whole world, an okra plant. Uh, after you plant the okra seed, they look like little bitty tiny balls uh, it, and they become seedlings, then they start growing leaves and that's so that they can make glucose through the process of photosynthesis. These big leaves are exposed to the sun and with water and with carbon dioxide through the process of photosynthesis, they make glucose. Then as the plant gets older, it forms this beautiful flower. I guess I should point with my uh, cursor and not with my hands. It's a mallow flower. This plant happens to be part of the mallow family. And when the flower fades, it forms a fruit. And over here, you see the delicious okra itself. And inside, guess what, are the seeds. And when the seeds fall to the ground, starts the process over again. It's a cycle, a life cycle. Now, pecan trees, this is another one of my favorite seeds. Uh, the pecan tree is the state tree of Texas and it comes from a seed and the seed is called a pecan. And uh, on the left is what they look like when we buy them at the store or pick them up in the park. But over on the right hand side shows you what they look like when they're growing on the tree. Now I have a word of caution here. You see this uh, green husk on the outside of the pecan itself, that green husk, do not pick it off because it will stain your fingers. I don't mean it'll make them dirty. I mean, it will dye them and you won't be able to wash it off. It doesn't wash off. You, it just has to wear off. So wait till the tree releases the pecans from the husk and then pick them up off the ground, but don't try to pick them out of that or else uh, you'll have dyed fingers. Now here's a tomato plant and we're all familiar with tomato. It's one of the favorite fruits uh, that we eat here in the United States. Over on the right is a picture of the tomato plant with both green and ripe tomatoes. I eat them both ways. I eat uh, green tomatoes in uh, uh, green tomato chutney or green tomato chow chow. 
and I eat the red tomatoes sliced as a salad. Now over on the left is a picture of the tomato sliced in half and you can see these little seeds all in here. And guess what? Each one of those seeds can make a whole plant by itself when it's planted. Okay, grass. Now what's the deal about grass? Grass is a fascinating plant. When it first starts growing, it looks like this over on the left. It just looks like grass leaves. Many grasses actually have more of the plant underground than they do above ground. And um, uh, the seed heads that you see on these, these, this grass, this grass is called sorghum. And we feed animals this part. And then we take these long stems and crush them and take the juice and cook it up and make syrup. How about that? Now this is a succulent and it doesn't have to start with from a seed. It can get started from a cutting. So you can remove one of these blades, it's really part of a stem, and stick it in a pot and guess what it'll form? It'll form a new succulent like that. So that's a pretty clever way of getting going too, isn't it? All right, so let's talk about activities at home or at school. Find a plant at home school or at the park. What color is it? Well, I bet you nickel it's gonna be green because green plants are the plants that make glucose and give us as a waste gas oxygen, which we all need to breathe. How tall is the plant? Draw a picture of the plant and color it and show it to your teacher. This is a good time to discuss in your class what the plant may have looked like when it was a baby. Do you think it looked like the parent plant? Do you think it looked different? Make sure when you do all of these activities that you have an adult with you. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And if you have any questions about the life cycle of plants, they are so fascinating. Uh, Dr. Gorman will be more than happy to share any information with you. Have a delightful day and I'll see you the next time. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Ms. Fuller. And we do have a question. And how big is a seed for a giant redwood tree? And how tall does a giant redwood tree grow? Okay, Miss Fuller just showed you about a tomato and the seed in it. Well, the seed for that giant redwood tree is just about the same size as the seed that was in that tomato that you looked at on her presentation. Uh, how tall do they grow? The giant redwood tree can reach 350 feet tall average of about 225 feet. Now guys, that's a lot of tree come from that one little bitty seed. Uh, so that, you know, I spent some time in my life in the jungles in Vietnam and those trees were about 200 feet tall, 250 feet tall, but I did not bring any seeds back to grow them. I did not do that. And now Ms. Ramirez is going to tell you about the life cycle of a darkling beetle. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and we're going to be learning about the life cycle of a darkling beetle. On a side note, I also went to Casa View when I was in elementary school. Uh, so we're going to get started. I'm going to show you guys briefly uh, a quick life cycle of the darkling beetle because I'm going to take my iPad and show you guys uh, my darkling beetle habitat. Uh, so first we have the eggs. The eggs are super tiny, so when we look in their habitat, you're not going to be able to see them. Um, out of the eggs will hatch what's called the larva. We also call it the mealworm. So just know that the larva and the mealworm, they are the same stage. The larva will then turn into the pupa, which is not going to be really moving. And then from the pupa out will emerge the adult beetle. So keep those four stages in mind as I show you guys my mealworm habitat. I'm going to share my iPad screen and I'm just going to let you know sometimes there is a weird uh, time delay between my voice and what the iPad is showing you. Um, so just be aware of that. I'm going to go ahead and share my iPad screen. And while I'm getting the uh, iPad linked, be th thinking about why are mealworms or beetles important to study and also think about um, what eats them for food. And I might be having some issues with my iPad. It doesn't want to, my touch screen doesn't want to work today. Oh no. So let's see. Let me stop the share and let me try it one more time. If not, we'll try something else. Well, that's weird. My iPad totally is not responding to my touch screen. Okay, let me try a different iPad. Sorry about the technical problems. 
And let's see if this iPad will do it. Again, while we're waiting, be thinking about why are mealworms important? There it goes. Sorry about that. Hopefully this iPad um, will work a little bit better and it's still connecting and I think we're connected finally. So let me pull up my camera and we'll go take a look at our worm or mealworm habitat. So here we are over here. So think about what are some things that you guys might see or notice and can you identify any of those four stages? So let's go ahead and start with our first, uh, this stage right over here. So these are the adult darkling beetles. They are insects because they have six legs and two antenna. And you can see that they're on top of the potato. Uh, they get water or moisture from the potato. Now it's the adult females that will lay the eggs, but remember those eggs are super tiny, so we're not gonna be able to see them. So that's the adult darkling beetle. The next stage we have would be the eggs. Again, we're not gonna see the eggs, but out of the eggs we'll have what's called the larva. So I'm gonna dig around and see if we can find some larva. There's actually a super tiny larva right there on that potato. Let's see if we can find a bigger stage of the larva. And I'm gonna flip that potato over. And there are lots of larva on the underside of this potato. So when the larva first hatches out of that tiny egg, the larva is super tiny. And as it grows, it will actually shed its skin called its exoskeleton. And every time it sheds its skin or exoskeleton, it will get a little bit bigger. Now the typical maximum size for the larva would be something like this one that you see here. And once it gets to that size, its body will start to slow down in functions and it's gonna start to curl into a little white ball called the pupa. Now let's see if we can find some pupa. I found some earlier. And then here over here we have the pupa. So notice the pupa are not moving. Um, they're rather white or pale in color. And the closer they are to turning into the actual adult, they will actually get darker in color and you might be able to make out some of their adult features. So you might be able to see some of their eyes or maybe what might turn into their legs and their antenna. And then from the pupa stage, they will turn into the adult. So those are the main stages of a darkling beetle or a mealworm. Now they get the name mealworm because they look like a worm. But if you have these in your classroom, if you have the chance to pick them up and look at them with a magnifying glass, you'll notice that they actually have six legs. So they are an insect too. And the reason that it's important to learn about them is because we have lots of animals at the Environmental Center that love to eat them for food. One of those animals would be Spike the Bearded Dragon. And uh, sometimes he might not eat in front of the camera, but I'm gonna try and put some in front of him and see what he does. So there's some mealworms. Sometimes he's been a little camera shy lately, um, but he actually loves to eat mealworms. They have lots of good protein. So I don't think he's gonna eat for us today, but there is Spike. I'm gonna go ahead and stop our screen share with our iPad. I'm gonna come back to our computer and then I'm gonna share my computer screen this time. So let me get our presentation going. And I have a couple of questions for you guys. So my first two essential questions are hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first is what do we call the type of metamorphosis that darkling beetles go through? And the second is a mealworm, an insect or a worm, and you should be able to explain that. So keep those two questions in mind as we go through the presentation. So just a quick review with our diagram. The darkling beetle uh, will lay eggs and the female will do that. Um, from the egg, we'll hatch the larva. And here's a picture of the larva shedding its skin or exoskeleton. And it will do that multiple times until it gets to the maximum size for that larva. Eventually that larva will turn into the pupa. Again, the pupa is kind of like a resting stage. It's not gonna be moving a lot, but inside that organism is preparing its body and it is changing to prepare itself to emerge as the adult beetle. So because this organism has four life stages, it is called complete metamorphosis. So in complete metamorphosis, we typically have that resting stage called the pupa. And then I have a quick little video to show you 
the actual transformation between the larva, also called the mealworm, as it turns into the pupa. So let's watch the little video. And you can see here, um, this larva, it's starting to push off its old exoskeleton or skin, and then out will emerge the pupa. And notice how pale that pupa is when it first emerges. Again, when you see the pupa, it's not really going to be moving too much. It's a very vulnerable stage. It's not going to be able to move around or protect itself from predators that might eat it. But if you look really closely at the pupa, you might be able to make out body features of the future adult. So you can see what might what would turn into the eyes, the antenna, and the legs. And eventually that pupa will totally shed all of that old exoskeleton off. So there's our pupa. Now let's take a look at how the pupa turns into the adult. So here's another time-lapse video. Now as that pupa gets closer to turning into an adult, it will actually get really dark in color. So see how much darker this pupa is compared to that early stage pupa. And you can clearly see what's gonna be some of those features. We have the eyes, the antenna, and those legs. So that pupa will also begin to shed its old exoskeleton. It will push off that old skin and eventually out will emerge that adult beetle. And as soon as that adult beetle emerges, it's also going to be rather white or pale in color. So you can see how it uses its legs um, and its abdomen to help push off that old exoskeleton. And hopefully when you guys were looking at my mealworm bin, you probably saw a whole bunch of those old skin, that old exoskeleton scattered around the mealworm bin. And there's our adult beetle. Now it will take a couple of days for him to get his color. So he's that typical brown or black color that you guys saw in my mealworm bin. So we know that indeed these guys are insects. They have six legs and two antenna. And then I have a quick little challenge for you guys. It is a beetle scavenger hunt. So sometime when it's nice and sunny, go outside and find an adult beetle, a larva or a pupa. And then with the help of an adult, take a picture of it or draw and color it and try to identify what type of beetle it is. So a good website for you guys would be bugguide.net, this website right here. It has lots of pretty pictures of different beetles. And some common beetles that you guys probably see, we're getting toward the summertime. A lot of times during our patio, by our patio lights, you might see those big brown June bugs flying around. Those are beetles. Of course, ladybugs are also beetles too. And then we're starting to see those lightning bugs at night too. Those are also beetles. So see what you guys can find outside. And then I'm going to stop our screen share and I have something cool that I found online. These are actually edible mealworms. Um, they're called larvets and they come in a variety of different flavors, um, but people around the world actually eat them for food. And I found one that actually tastes okay. Um, these are Mexican spice flavor mealworms and they look like this. Now, obviously these guys have been uh, cleaned and they've been cooked, they've been air fried. And if you ever have a chance uh, to eat them, they kind of taste like a crispy Frito, one of those uh, corn chips. Uh, so that's what they look like. Um, I thought it was interesting to try something new. So that, there you go. That is the larvette. And that's all I have for you guys for the life cycle of a mealworm or a darkling beetle. We're going to give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you much, Ms. Ramirez. And the question is, are darkling beetles harmful to humans? And the answer, no, they usually do not buy humans unless they're really irritated and they don't carry any kind of disease or spread any disease. So no, basically they're not harmful to humans. And now Ms. Nash is gonna tell you about the life cycle of a butterfly. Hello, welcome to my classroom. Today we're talking about everyone's favorite insect, the butterfly. And this is a great time of year with all the flowers blooming to go observe some butterflies. I saw some really great ones in my garden yesterday, and I'll tell you about those in a minute. But let's look at some pictures. We can't go outside. It's raining out here. I don't know if it's raining where you, it wasn't raining at my house this morning, but it was sure raining out here in Sudan. 
Okay, so there we go. So like the mealworm, the butterflies have what we call complete metamorphosis. That word metamorphosis just means great big change because they go up through some great big changes in their life cycle, don't they? So they have the first stages, the egg, the larva that we call a caterpillar, the pupa that we call a chrysalis for a butterfly, and then the adult. The adult will mate, the female will lay eggs, and the whole thing can start over again. The eggs are really tiny. So here's a monarch egg on a leaf. You can tell how tiny it is by looking at the veins on that leaf. Here's our caterpillar. And the larva of the monarch eats one kind of plant, the milkweed. And the milkweed plant has a toxic alkaloids in it. And as a result, the caterpillar can safely eat them because they've evolved along with the milkweed. But if a bird eats that caterpillar, the bird gets really sick. And then it goes, well, I'll never eat that one again. So it's a protection, a really amazing kind of partnership there. And then the, the pupa, the beautiful pupa, we call that a chrysalis. And here's the adult. Notice that the adult and the caterpillar have these bright colors, and those are warnings for that bird to leave me alone. Now here's another really common butterfly that we have around called the hackberry butterfly. And as you might guess from the name, they like to lay their eggs on a hackberry leaf. And interestingly enough, most kinds of butterflies lay their eggs on either one kind of plant or a family of plants. So they're very what we call host specific. So here's the eggs right here, tiny, tiny, at the leaf of the hackberry. And here's that caterpillar. Hmm. Notice that this caterpillar is green. And this one needs camouflage. It doesn't want to stand out and warm birds not to eat it. They need to hide so they can't find it. Because the hackberry leaf is not toxic. In fact, if you have a dog or watch the horses or the goats out here, they love hackberry leaves. They must be really yummy. And here's one that I saw this weekend at my house. I was so excited. The first one I'd seen all, all year. It was the giant swallowtail. Look at that butterfly. They're as big as their hand. They're our biggest native butterfly, and they are beautiful. And again, they lay their eggs on one kind of plant, okay? Plants in the citrus family, okay? So the farmers in, in the valley, they grow grapefruits and oranges and lemons. They hate them because they eat the leaves. But here in this part of Texas, we have the prickly ash okay, that they lay their eggs on. And the amazing thing about this one is that the caterpillars, when they're little, they look just like a bird dropping or bird poop, right? So nobody wants to eat that, yuck. So they just fly around there on the, on the leaf and no one's gonna eat them. They're really well protected by that unique kind of color. And then they get bigger when they get really big, because it's gonna be a big butterfly. Um, they're too big to plausibly be bird droppings. And then they change color. And now they're more camouflaged to look like the stem or the bark of the tree. And then finally, the pupa, the chrysalis, looks like the bark of the tree again. Look at that amazing, amazing camouflage. And then the adult. Another one that I saw in my garden earlier this year is the pipe vine swallowtail. So the swallowtail family has these tails on their hind wing, okay? Beautiful blue butterfly with bright orange spots on the underside of the wing to again warn birds, don't eat me. They eat a toxic plant also, the pipe vine. And look at your orange spots on that black caterpillar. Again, that's a warning. Okay. And here's that interesting chrysalis or pupa. So the adult butterfly do not eat. They just drink nectar. So they go from flower to flower drinking all that nice sugary nectar for their energy. And they are also, at the same time they're drinking nectar, they get pollen from the flower, here's the pollen, stuck on their body. 
and then they go to the next flower and they take the pollen with them and they that helps the plant make seeds. So the plant gets pollinated to make seeds to grow new plants and the butterflies get the food the energy they need. Okay. So just a red animal here, our painted lady, our tiger swallowtail with the stripes going, going vertically up and down, the funny snout butterfly. So again, as I said, Butterflies lay their eggs on one kind of plant or family. So the monarch needs the milkweed. And we have two native milkweeds in this part of the Texas. You may see by the side of the road, so I haven't mowed them down. The antler horn right here and the green milkweed. And here's another native plant that the butterflies use, the pipe vine. It's that weird flower, like a pipe. There's our hackberry tree. They're all around. You can see some of them chewing holes in this one right here. So they have that weird wart that bark, that rough, bumpy bark. You can find that tree and look and see if you see any butterflies around. And then here's the prickly ash or the toothache tree. And look at the bumpy, weird, weird bark on that trunk. And it's full of thorns. Okay, really interesting. So you can, if you find a leaf out in the garden or the park and it's got holes in it, you can assume that probably a caterpillar made those holes, a hungry caterpillar. And if you have your hand lens with you, sometimes you can see the little bite marks from the caterpillar, kind of fun. If you find the caterpillar and you want to raise it at home in a jar or a container, Make sure you know just what leaf, because again, they don't eat just any leaf. If I gave the caterpillar lettuce, they wouldn't eat it. It has to be their leaf, the kind of leaf they like to eat. And you have to give them fresh leaves every day. So it's kind of a hard thing to do to raise a caterpillar. Now, I was raising a few caterpillars here. And when I left for the long weekend, I said, good luck, guys. Wait for me. But they didn't wait. They've all hatched out of there. They've all come out of their chrysalis today. And I came in this morning. I left the door open on their little container here. So they would like beat themselves to death trying to get out. And the, the room was full of butterflies. So I caught I caught the ones that had come out already and set them free outside. They don't like the rain very much, so I hope they'll be okay. But in here, I can see them. They all crawled up to the top. Okay. You can see them. They've come out of their Christmas and they're just kind of waiting. Okay. They're like a sunny day. So I'll set some of them free okay. in a little while if the sun comes out. They need to find some flowers to get them. So one thing, another thing you can do besides looking for caterpillars on leaves, you can go out and observe the flowers that they're using. So butterflies will like certain flowers more than others and see if you can figure out which ones they like this. Don't catch them. It's really bad for their wings if you touch their wings, okay? Because they've got little scales on it. They rub off and then they can't fly very well. So just observe them. Right. So enjoy studying and learning more about butterflies. If you have any questions, Dr. Gorman can answer. Thank you, Ms. Nash. Question is, what is the smallest butterfly? Uh, the Western Pygmy Blue. The world's smallest butterfly is the Western Pygmy Blue. It has a wingspan of one half to three quarters of an inch and it is native to the Western United States. And now, Mr. Monroe is going to discuss the life cycle. Hello, everyone. My name is Mr. Monroe, and we're going to be looking into the stages of development during the life cycle of a quail. Now quail are actually a small bird. They're considered to be a ground bird because they make their nest on the ground. And uh, quail are very popular as a game, hunting game. And they're very popular because some people simply raise them for fun. And then some people raise them 
I guess, as a food source. Now, I wasn't really aware of how many different kinds of quail or how many different species of quail they, that existed. The only species of quail that I was familiar with, and that's simply because of where I was born and raised, was the Bob White quail. And since moving to Texas, I found out that Texas, not only is the Bob White a common quail here in the state of Texas, but they also have blue quail. And there are some people that raise feral quail. Well, today we're going to be looking at the stages of development in a very fast growing, a fast maturing quail called a Caternix. And simply, you know that they're very similar to chickens, they hatch from an egg. And after that uh, hatching from the egg, then they start their development stages. And one of the things that's really, really strange is that there are a lot of people that actually use the names for those developmental stages. They're very similar to the names given to developmental stages of humans. So let's, I've got a short video that I wanna show you. So let me share my screen with you and let's watch this video. Now these little babies are about two days old. And they're moving around pretty, pretty good for a two day old quail. Whoa. Very, very small, but very, very active. And that was a short video, right? Well, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen with you guys. And we're going to start looking at some real live quail hopefully that represent each of those developmental stages in the life cycle of a Caternix quail. Well, simply they start out from an egg that looks just like this, guys. Kind of speckled, yep. And uh, it takes 17 days for a Caternix quail to hatch from an egg. And the amazing thing is, that they are bound and determined to hatch from that egg because the little uh, quail that you vis uh, viewed in the video, they actually, this is one of their eggs and they actually peck their way out of this egg. And if you look at it, the shell of the egg is very thick. So that little quail had to really work very hard. Now, while we're going through this presentation, I want you to try to remember some of the things that uh, I'm going to be mentioning to you because your teacher might just ask you a couple of questions later on about what you viewed. You know, sometimes uh, we just simply call the baby quails babies, but there is a name that is given to those babies. They are called buttons. And I guess it comes from the, the little phrase as cute as a button. And as you observe, those little two day old quail that were in the video, they were as cute as a button. And you know, as they grow older, they will start resembling their parents. And I wonder why. Why do you think they would start looking like and having the same characteristics as their parents? Well, we'll talk about that a little later on. But you know, for the first 10 days, baby quail are called buttons. And at that time, you know, if you're letting them be born in an incubator, there's no mama around to sit and keep them warm, is there? So heat regulation and light regulation is very important to the buttons because they don't have that mama's body to keep them warm because you know, we birds are warm blooded, right? Now, once they pass the 10 day old period, they then move into the next stage of development, which is referred to as being a toddler. Now we know that toddler term is used in the <laughs> description of two and three year old kids that are very active. And then once they uh, go past the 21st day after their birth, they start moving into the next phase or the next developmental stage and that is they become what we call 
teenagers. Now that period of time will last from the 22nd day to the 56th day. And at that point, they then become an adult. Now, once they become a young adult, an adult, at about the age of one year, they enter what we call the golden years. They then become senior citizens. Everything starts to slow down. The egg laying starts to slow down, the breeding, the mating, the, the birth of uh, the eggs being fertile, that slows down. So they just become senior citizens somewhere between the 56th or 57th day and a year. Now, the reason that they look like their parents and their grandparents is simply because of heredity. Genes being passed on from generation to generation of the quail as they go through their developmental stages, which is part of their life cycle. Now, you know, they come in different colors. Some of them may be very dark brown. Some of them may be kind of brownish uh, and the feathers are appearing to have a scale, scaling like pattern. They come in caramel, they come in mottled brown and some even come in the color white. Now, Students, I've got a couple of uh, quail that I'm going to show you, I'm going to attempt to show you. Uh, I'm gonna start out by showing you, it's not a button quail. Remember, we observed those buttons just a few minutes ago, right, in the video. But these guys are considered to be somewhere between 11 days old to 21 days old. So it would make them be what we call toddlers. So bear with me. This is an example of a toddler. Now, I have a feeling because of the way the feathers are with this little one, that this is, when it reaches full adulthood, I believe this one's gonna be white in color. Now that white color is probably passed on from either its mom or dad or even the grandparents. We don't know because they were not hatched actually by the mama sitting on the eggs, they were actually hatched in an incubator. That's an apparatus that gives the conditions of heat and the correct amount of moisture and the right amount of days being exposed to that environment and then the eggs hatch out. They're very active. In fact, very hard to catch because they can run very well. That's why they're considered to be a ground bird. Now, after the 21st day, they enter the next phase, which is the teen stage. Now, I don't have a teen, an actual teen to show you. What I do have is one that is considered to be a young adult. So I'm going to be very careful to open up this box and try to hold this young adult because they can fly. And if they fly away, then it's very hard to catch them and they won't come back. This is a young adult. A little bit bigger than the toddler, right? Now, this one is pretty close to start her phase of laying eggs. I do believe that this is a female Coternix quail. Okay. She's acting like she's a little sleepy but she's a cutie, isn't she? <laughs> so I'm gonna put her back. And then I've got a real challenge, guys. I've got an adult female here in the next container. And I've got to be very careful when I get her out because she can really fly. Come here, girl. There she is. And she just flew away, <laughs> Golly. You guys didn't get a good look at her, but I'll eventually end up catching her uh, with the net. Now, listen, you saw how well she flew, you heard that flutter, and a lot of times quail use that sound to startle folks. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Dr. Gorman. <laughs> if any of you have any questions, 
I've got to try to catch that quail. At least she's in the building here and she can't really fly real high. So you guys wish me luck in trying to catch her, all right? You guys have a good day. And uh, hopefully you've learned a little bit about the stages of the life cycle of a quail. Mr. Monroe, we did get to see a quail. Let's see, I believe they call that flushing, flushing a quail when they fly like that. That one, that one did a real good demonstration. Uh, we do have a question. How long do wild quail live? And quail in the wild have a lifespan of two to three years. And now I am going to uh, share my screen. And during this virtual field trip, students discover that organisms undergo similar life processes. Students explored and compared the life cycle of living organisms. Uh, Ms. Fuller explained to you about the life cycle of a plant. Ms. Ramirez covered the life cycle of a darkling beetle. Ms. Nash discussed the life cycle of a butterfly. And Mr. Monroe showed you the life cycle of a quail and how well they can fly. Teachers, how did we do? Thank you for watching. Uh, if you would go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback, fill out a short form, send it back to us. We would appreciate it. And we will again want to thank you so much for joining us today. Hope you have a great rest of the day. Most importantly though, I hope you have a great rest of your life. Thank you.